stand and turn to the cross and begin prayer. In nomine Patris et Filius Spiritus Sancti. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory together with your Father and your all holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. It's right down there. Just, just turn off the whole power source out. Okay. Oh, we got a lot of people here. This is good. Hopefully a few more people will roll in. Um, we ran out of one candle. When did you run out of? The mask. Well, you should get here earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I bought my candle. This is for somebody. I'll make more. Yeah. I wanted to make one then. Don't worry. It's okay. I handed them out. I hand them out all the time. So next time, you know, you can look on with your friend if you don't have one. Um, I'll put out more next time. Uh, welcome to St. John's. Welcome to St. John's Institute of Catholic Culture. For those that are here for the first time, uh, about four months ago, we started a full-time adult education program here at St. John's um, called the Institute of Catholic Culture. And the goal is to educate the faithful uh, that have not been educated. That's you, no. <laughs> no, but we're all in need. We're all in need of further education, and the faith. Um, is the belief in an infinite and eternal God, and therefore our knowledge can never capture the whole of what our Lord has to offer until we stand before him and look into his eyes. And so here on earth, we're constantly preparing the way for that by educating ourselves, by going to Mass, by working on the life of holiness. And so... Um, our goal here is to um, offer in an orthodox manner um, traditional Catholicism as it was presented and taught traditionally, historically in the church. Um, dealing with history, dealing with philosophy, theology, scripture, liturgy, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, as you look around, you see some of the flyers. We've had other events too, but... Um, Constantly, we have ongoing uh, adult education programs here, so you're always more than welcome to come. Upcoming this weekend, Father Gripsover is giving his what third in a series now. Uh, at, at the beginning of every season, change of, of uh, liturgical season, Father Gripsover gives a little practicum how to on the uh, divine office because it gets a little confusing sometimes. And so he gets in there and just kind of gives you the practicals: turn here, turn there. This is where the prayer goes in, that kind of thing. He's doing that this Saturday. Um, as we leave behind us uh, Blessed Christmas in the festival season. Also, January 24th is coming up. Dr. John Cunnaback is coming back. Okay, He was excellent last time. He is uh, one of my mentors from Christendom College. He's an excellent teacher. I can't recommend him enough. Um, much better than I am, much better than most of uh, the other speakers I will be able to get because he's just a, he's extremely gifted in his ability to teach. Uh, he's a philosophy professor at Christendom College, and so he's going to be t talking on who are you, the nature of man. Okay, so those are two things that are coming up, and also I have the flyer here for this deal, which will give you all the details about when we're ending. We end February 20th, hopefully, if I finish. We might go an extra week, but um, that's that. To finish the first part, right? But we are going to be the whole year now. We're going to deal with other topics. Our goal here over the next few weeks, five weeks, or whatever we have together, is to cover the entire Bible. <laughs> Salvation history. How do you do that? Well, here's the thing. Raise your hand if you recognize these names. Adam and Eve. Humor. The Flood. 
Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Come on, seriously, put up your hands. Okay, all right. The Babylonian exile. Most, okay, good. Jesus. All right. How many people know the third son of Adam? Um, you see, we have a problem. Because, although some of you don't have a problem. If you do not know the third son of Adam, within a couple of chapters of Genesis, you're going to be lost. How many of you know who Enoch was? Mm. If you don't know who Enoch was, you won't know who Noah was, and therefore you're going to be lost. How many know where Mount Moriah was historically, literally historically? What mountain was it? Mm. If you don't know what Mount Moriah, where Mount Moriah was, Again, you're not going to be able to read the story of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac and understand it in its historical context. How many of you know who Jeroboam was? A few of you. If you don't know who Jeroboam was, you won't know why there was a Babylonian exile. You remember when our Lord was, um, or when, when John the Baptist was on the edge of the Jordan, was baptizing people, and um, the Pharisees sent men to go and ask him, Who are you? Who are you? And what did they say next? Some say you're the prophet. Yeah, he says, Are you the prophet? What prophet are they talking about? Elijah. No. It's a good guess. It's an excellent guess. What prophet? There was the prophet among the Jews. The prophet. If you don't know who the prophet was, guess what? You're not going to know who Jesus is because they're looking for the Messiah. And the Messiah is going to be the prophet returned. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, John the Baptist is the new Elijah, but... They're looking for the Messiah. Okay, so you see, the problem is, is as Catholics, unfortunately, also, as I, I'm sure, but also as Protestants, that we know all these stories of salvation history, all these pictures. You could probably recount to me the story of the flood pretty quick and get all the major details. But unfortunately, we don't know the stories around those stories. And so the Bible becomes a massive collection of stories that don't fit together. Okay, that's a pretty big book with lots of thin pages of stories that you're supposed to somehow find the story of salvation in and, and be inspired by and all that stuff. And there's some weird stories in there and a lot of people being killed and we're going to look at some of, those, some of those stories. Our goal over the next five weeks is to go through the entire Bible and I'm not going to let you get comfortable. We're never going to go into a story that you already know. Okay, what we're going to do is go in and dive into those stories that you don't know so that we can, in a sense, build the bridge so that you can see all of the stories of Scripture as one story because who is the author of the Bible? God is the author of the Bible. Who else is the author of the Bible? Moses. Yeah, Moses, the author of the, of the Pentateuch by tradition. Okay. Hundreds, hundreds of men writing, okay, that we read. And so when we're reading through the scriptures, what happens is, because the stories change up a little bit, the guy's got a little different character the way he's writing. God doesn't sit there and grab Moses or grab uh, uh, St. John and just say, I want you to write this directly, literally, boom, 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 and tell him all the words and how, how it's supposed to, where the commas are supposed to go and whatnot. It's not how he does it. He inspires and lifts up the person to use their own talents. And so as we go from book to book, we need to learn who the person is what their character is and what their background is so that we can start to read those books properly. And when we do that, we'll start to see underneath the surface of that text the divine author writing one story from beginning to end. That's our goal. What points in the Bible become are for you are the most boring? Are the, the places where, you know, at the beginning of Lent, you start Genesis chapter 1, you start, or what, January 1st? Maybe How many of you guys started January 1st? Anybody? 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, have you given up yet? No. <laughs> That's right. It's so a word we usually give up. Leviticus. Leviticus. Okay, where else might we give up? Numbers. Numbers. Where else? Pinks. All right. You know, pinks is pretty exciting. Where else? What other little little stories within a book might we hit and go, oh my gosh. No, we just skip to the next heading that appeals. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what, what are those, what sections are those that we skip over? Genealogies. The genealogies. And I'm here to tell you that if you skip the genealogies, you will not understand the Bible. The genealogies are there for a reason. This book, especially the Old Testament, but the whole of the Bible, was written by a people that believed that God had chosen them, whether you believe it or not, I do, that God had chosen them to save the world. They're not going to write things down which don't mean anything. Especially in Genesis. Uh, Especially in Genesis. This is the story of the very beginning of their story. They're not going to put in stupid details that don't matter. So when you hit a genealogy right off the bat in Genesis... Pay attention, because the author is trying to tell us something. The author is trying to give us that bridge to follow the storyline. And because we're used to reading the New York Times, and it doesn't read like the New York Times does, we put the Bible down, and it becomes a dusty book on our shelf. Okay, That's a tragedy, because in this book are written the words of our salvation. It's the instruction for our lives. To get to heaven. The words of God telling us how to walk back to paradise. That's what it's all about. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of those things. And we're going to be flying through the scriptures. Skipping all of those stories you already know. Except we might hit a couple things you don't know within those stories. <clears throat> but we're going to build that bridge. All the way from Adam to Christ. And from Christ to St. John as he stands before the throne of God in the book of Revelation, if we get there. Okay? So open up your Bibles. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. There's a couple of people that are here tonight as um, to just to see if I actually could get out of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. They don't believe I can. I'm not only going to get out of it, we're going to cover all of Genesis. <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How many days did it take God to create? Okay, let me back up just a second. I might hit some things along the way that you guys already know. Okay? I might point out some things that maybe you've already studied. Some of you have read some Scott Hahn stuff. Yes. Some of you have. Some of you haven't. Other... uh, other modern scholars, which are which are great, reading articles. So we're going to hit some things you may know, and we hit some things you may not know. So if you get to something that, if we get to something you already know, then share it with us so we can go faster. Okay? How many how many days in creation? Six, six days. And was the sixth day the end? No. What's what is the conclusion of the creation story? The highlight, the peak. Creation. The seventh day, God rested. And when, what did God do when he rested? He blessed all of creation. And when, as St. Thomas says, some of you have been with me before, when God blesses something, what happens to the thing? It's good. It's, it's brought to perfection. Okay? It's made holy. It's made to be like God himself. Okay? Why do you suppose God created in a seven-day structure? Some of you know this. Tell me. Why? Seven is the word open. Okay. What Annie's pointing to is that in Hebrew, the number seven, okay, the word for seven, sorry, the word for seven, has two meanings. Okay? It is, I should be here, like Shabbat. Okay? In our English alphabet. Shabbat. It has two meanings. One meaning is the number seven, and the other meaning is oath. 
or a covenant. We have words like that in English that have two meanings. Okay, they're spelled the same way. So oftentimes in the scriptures, you will see a repetition of the number seven. And the reason is, it's trying to communicate to us something more than just the number seven. God didn't just say, oh, I've got to create all these things. It's going to take me, let's see, seven days or six days. Okay, I'm going to be really tired at the end because I worked really hard all week. It's not like that at all. That God created within a seven-day structure for a reason. He created within a seven-day structure to tell us that he desired a covenant union. He desired to make an oath with his creation. And when a covenant is made between two parties, what happens to those two parties? What happens to them? I make an agreement about something with whoever. Okay, with Ed. You become partners. And in relation to that thing, we are in agreement. We are one. You've heard of the marriage covenant. And in Genesis, the marriage covenant, it said, it says, when man and woman are joined together, the two become one. In a covenant, two parties become one. God in the beginning desired to make his creation in such a way that it would be drawn up into him and that creation would be divinized. That was his plan. Man was to be divinized. He was to be made a partaker in the divine life. In fact, St. Athanasius says in his, in his work on the Incarnation, he says, God became man that man could become God. Okay? It's the same to the church. That was God's plan in the beginning. When the text says that man is made in the image and likeness of God, what do you think is meant by that? The image and likeness of God. Man is made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah, he's made to be a son of God. We won't look at it right now, but in Genesis chapter 5, if you wanted to write it down, you can look it up. Verses 1 through 3, the same phrase is used, image and likeness, in regard to Adam's third son. He's made in his image and likeness. Okay? It's a Hebrew way of saying sonship. The creator is revealed on day 6 when he creates man as not just a creator, but a father who is creating a son in his image and likeness. Again, that was God's plan from the beginning. We have to get this down because all of salvation history will be a story of trying to get that back. Trying to get back what was lost at the fall. So we need to recognize what we had before the fall. What did God plant in the Garden of Eden that was special? The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And if they ate of the tree of life, what would happen? They would live forever. They would live forever. Who lives forever? God. God lives forever. God desired that man would share in God's own life. And if they ate of the tree of knowledge, what would happen? They would die. They would die. He says, if you eat of this tree, he says, don't eat it. If the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now remember, God didn't say, I will kill you. He said, you will die. It will be the natural consequence of your action. Remember, whenever the church says something's a mortal sin, it's not because, you know, the Pope's standing up on his throne going, you know, to hell with you. And, and condemning you. Not at all. He's saying, if you do this, you're going to separate yourself from the source of life. You're going to separate yourself from God. So God said, do not eat of the tree of knowledge, for in the day that you eat of it, you're going to die. And so what happened? They ate of it. And they received death. Upon themselves, something which God never designed for man. Man was not supposed to die. All of salvation history, again, will be the story of man living or dying. And when man comes into contact with God and he lives a just life, 
he will be rewarded with life because he has communion with God. And when you have a covenant relationship with somebody, the two become one and they share the things that are theirs. And so when man comes into contact with God and he lives with God as a friend of God, he receives eternal life. But when he breaks the covenant with God, he will receive death because he separates himself from that source of life. And there it is right in the beginning, that covenant relationship and that option. And God will set before them life and death. As we read in the book of Deuteronomy, as, as Israel is about to enter into the promised land, God says, I set before you this day life and death. Choose life. Okay, that's, a great, that's a great text to, to read uh, just before we go on the march for life. <laughs> so they chose death. They ate from the tree of life and they received their reward, their just reward for what they had done. But God was not done because God would not be outdone. And so what did he do? What was God's plan then? Was he saying, fine, go ahead. Okay, go ahead and go whatever. You know, eat with the pigs and die forever. Forget it. My plan is over. No. What did God do? It's right in the text. What do you want? Genesis 3.15? Genesis chapter, yes, Genesis 3.15. Can you read that for us? Because they are out of the Eden, not that they don't eat. We'll get there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head while you strike at his heel. Go ahead. Okay. To the woman he said, I will intensify the pangs of your childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children, yet your urge shall be for your husband, and he shall be your master. Okay, so these are the curses. And that text of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is traditionally called what? The Proto Evangelium. The Proto Evangelium. The first good news, the first gospel. Why is it the first good news? What's being said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? That the promised one would triumph over e over the evil one, over the serpent to whom he was speaking. Yeah. Satan. And that through a woman, right, through her seed, the devil would be conquered. Right there in the beginning, God says there will be a battle. There will be a struggle between life and death. There will be a struggle and a battle over man. And God will win. Now you know the story of the whole Bible. That battle is the story of salvation history. From that point on, all of salvation history is a war. It's a battle between God and the devil. And if we lose sight of that, and we stand in 2006 with you know, all our sensitivities, and, 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 and oh, but God, why did they kill the Canaanites? That wasn't quite fair. It's a battle for man. And God wants him to live. And that battle will be a bloody one. Man was made a son of God. The, the, the church fathers say that in the beginning, Adam and Eve didn't have clothes on like we wear. Okay? But they were clothed with something much greater than that. And what was that? Glory and honor. Yeah, they were robed with the glory of God. The church fathers called the robe of glory. It's the grace of God. Where do you see that in here? He's made it well. We can get this. Did you come to Genesis? A little less than God be crowned with glory. Did you come to Genesis one through three? I'm saying the church fathers interpreted the text saying man is made in the image and likeness of God. He's made a son of God and therefore he wears the spiritual robe. He's sharing in the life of God. And the church fathers called that the robe of glory. And you're right, throughout the scriptures we see references to that. Okay, But at the fall, Adam looked at himself and what did he see? He found himself naked and ashamed. Because, as the fathers say, he cast off that robe of glory, that sonship which he shared with the father, and he found himself naked. 
And so he clothed himself in fig leaves. And when God came on the scene, what did God make for him? A coat, fur coat. Yeah, animal skin. Okay, of a dead animal. The man who was made to reflect God now walked in the clothing of the animals. He acted like an animal, and therefore he no longer reflected his father. Again, the story of salvation history will be the story of gaining that robe back, of casting off that garment of animal skin, and walking back into the life of God again. Where do you think this church fathers see? What do you think they see in the stripping of Christ? But that casting off of that garment of sin from humanity <coughs> to receive the life of grace. We'll talk about that some more. Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Why? Norma, don't answer that. Why? Protection from the tree of life. Right. Okay. We say, oh, disobeyed God. disobeyed God. Yes, that's true. That's the beginning of the problem. But look at the end of chapter 3 of Genesis. Verse 20. The man called his, called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground. And he placed a cherub with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life at the east of Eden. Okay. God cast Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden in order that they would not eat from the tree of life. Why would God not want them to eat from the tree of life? To be eternally damned. Why do you say that? Because they've broken the covenant, so until they're saved, if they live forever, they'll be live forever eternally damned. Okay. What he's making reference to is a number of church fathers, St. Ephraim in particular, says that if Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree of life in a state of fallen human nature, they would have lived forever in that fallen state, separated from God. Okay? St. Ephraim says that they would have lived as though buried alive. They would have been in hell. Separated from God for all eternity. So God, in his love for mankind, separates man from that which was made good for him and that which had become evil for him for one reason. In order that at the right time, at the right moment, God would prepare man to come back into that garden in obedience this time and to eat from that tree of life. And instead of dying forever, he would live forever. God's plan in the beginning was that he would feed man with his own life. And that through eating of the life of God, man would live forever. What's that sound like? Yeah, not by accident. If Jesus didn't say what he said in John 6, I wouldn't be following him today. Because that is the proof that he is the savior of man. That he feeds us with the life of God and gives us back what Adam lost in the beginning. Was that in Genesis also that God's promising feeding himself or or that Yeah, he gives them the tree of life, and if they eat of the tree of life, they would live forever, and life eternal is God's alone. So through eating of the tree of life, they would be consuming the life of God. You see? Alright. That's Genesis chapter one through three. Edmund, look at me go. <laughs> Coming out of the Garden of Eden, we meet two figures. What are their names? Cain and Abel. And you know the story of Cain and Abel. Turn to chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 17. Does she let me read that for us? Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod was the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael the father of Methuselah. 
Methushael. Okay, I won't make you do that. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay. Cain for a son. And what did they do at that point in history, in salvation history? They built a city. And they called the name of the city after who? Their son. After their son. Trying to make a name for themselves. Trying to make a kingdom for themselves. Trying to become powerful. Okay? Suddenly we get into a genealogy, and what do we do? Turn the page. Bad idea. Don't do it. Because this genealogy right here in the beginning is essential. Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to follow the story of the sons of God and the sons of men. Or the sons of God and the sons of the devil. Okay? Man made, God made Adam and Eve in his image and likeness. They bore a son, Abel. Abel was a just man. He offered a just sacrifice. Cain did not. We don't have time in this final study to get into why not. Sometime we'll do a Genesis Bible study. We'll do all of Genesis. Okay? With a, with a fine tooth comb. Why do we think that Cain's offering is not just? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We're not going to get into that today because we'll, we'll get stuck in Genesis chapter 3 and we'll never get out, or chapter 4 and never get out. And Edmund's smiling at me in the back. Okay? Amazing. We did Genesis 1, 2, 3 together. We'll keep going. Don't worry. We're going to finish the rest of Genesis another time. Um, Abel was killed by Cain. Okay? What was the name of Adam's third son who took the place of Abel? Seth. Good. Wow. <laughs> We're getting somewhere. Look at that. Did you all know it before? You no, no. I read the end. You read the end all the time. <laughs> all right. If we count the generations, don't do it right now because we have too much to talk about. Get home and do it. When you count the generations... From Cain all the way down the genealogy to the last man in the genealogy. What's his name? Lamech. Look at verse. Uh, uh, yeah, let's go up to the note. Verse 19. And Lamech took two wives. Mm, first time. Not a good idea. Okay. <laughs> Verse 23. And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Hearken to what I say. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy-sevenfold. What, which chapter? Four? Chapter 4, verse 23. Okay. Does that sound like a man that's repenting? No. No. The tradition is that Lamech killed Cain. That Lamech murdered Cain among the Jews. Okay? If you count the generations from Adam to Lamech, how many generations do you think we're going to get to? Seven. Seven generations. Lamech has made an oath and a covenant with the devil. The fullness, if you will, of evil. Okay? We know that Cain's line is going to be bad right off the bat when you hear that first verse in, in verse 17. Cain and his wife, and what did they do? They built a city and called the city after who? Not after God, but after their own son. Look at uh, verse 25. At the end of the genealogy then of Cain, we, get, we start the story again. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and Cain called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel. So, so he takes Abel's place. Is he going to be a good guy? Yeah, because he takes the good guy's place. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, Instead of building a city and calling it after your son, this line begins to call upon the name of the Lord. Do you see the parallel? Okay, the difference. Seven generations from Adam through Seth. 
Again, well, look at verse chapter 5. This is the book of the genealogies of uh, generations of Adam. Now, we always shut off right there, right? Great, another genealogy. And Seth and Enosh and Enosh and Kenan. And don't ever get confused. They weren't very creative with their names, so they kind of copied each other. So there's an Enoch on both sides, and there's all these, okay, and so on. Verse 21, chapter 5, verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, Enoch is the seventh generation. When Enoch had lived five years, he became the uh, sixty-five years. He became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Who else do we hear about this, that's to walk with God? I'm sorry, did you not chapter five? What? Chapter five, verse twenty-one. Okay. Who else is supposed to walk with God? Adam. Yeah, Adam should have walked with God. What did he do? What did he do when God came into the garden? Yeah. He hid from God. Okay, who else after this story is supposed to walk with God? Moses, yeah, even before that, Abraham. Remember, he says, walk before me. Okay, walk before me. That idea of walking with God, again, is that covenant union. And now you have a man who walks with God. Is 17 now? Yeah. One second. <clears throat> this Enoch... Is a different Enoch. Yes, I know yep. it's a different Enoch. Does it have does it have any reason at all to to make the first Enoch of Cain's generation uh, parallel? Yeah. No, I don't think so. so I don't think so. They just have similar names. Okay. okay. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. That's all the dates of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. What does it mean, God took him? Yeah, the tradition is that Enoch was taken, the tradition among the Jews even, that Enoch was taken, was assumed into heaven. Who else was assumed into heaven? Yeah. Ah, before Elijah. Mary. Elijah. Elijah. Okay, if you ever meet a, a Protestant that says uh, Mary couldn't have been assumed into heaven. No, that's not right. No, uh, because you're trying to make Mary God. There's a whole tradition in the Old Testament of people being assumed into heaven. There's nothing wrong with Mary being assumed. If you have a problem with Mary being assumed into heaven, then you have a problem with Elijah being assumed into heaven. You have a problem with Enoch being assumed into heaven. You have a problem with Moses being assumed into heaven, which was held by the Jews. That Moses' body was taken into heaven. Okay, we get that in the book of Jude. Anyways, that's a little side note. <laughs> do, the, do the Jews believe Elijah was assumed into heaven? Yeah. Yeah, that's why it was believed he was going to return. Okay? You notice, who shows up on, on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ? Moses. Moses. Moses and Elijah, two people have gotten assumed into heaven. Yeah. Okay? Not by accident. Okay. Um, Methuselah, Enoch's son. Again, you want to stop and go, oh, great, Methuselah, you can't even pronounce the name, blah, 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 blah. And you scan down, Methuselah lived so long. Uh, and Methuselah lived after the birth of Lamech, 780 so years. It's verse 28, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the father of a son and called his name Noah. Ooh, Noah is within the righteous line. The line of God, the sons of God. He calls him Noah, saying, Out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. That was one of the curses in Genesis chapter 3. You remember, by the sweat of your brow, Noah becomes one who, who reverses one of the curses of Genesis chapter 3. Okay? So you notice, notice how important the genealogies are. Okay? Who was that dad's or kids that were going to CCD? There you go. Come on in. You're all right. Um, here, sit on the floor. We've got plenty of room. Can you shut the door? And you're, you're fine. Your mom's right there. <laughs> Is it hot in here? It's hot in here? No, no, no. no. Just, just open that door. <laughs> we should, I'll tell you what, next time, you guys, the older people, because I don't want you to get sit, sit on this side, the younger people sit on that side, and we'll open the door and let cool air come in, because I'll die otherwise. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> okay. So you see the importance.
importance of the genealogies. And Noah comes on the scene, and what happens? What story? Go ahead. The flood. The flood. And what happens at the flood? Notice, in, at the beginning of creation, when God looked out over, when, when, well, Moses was writing, was looking out over creation, what did he say? What did he see first? There was what? Darkness? What else? What was covering? Yeah, water was covering the face of the abyss. Right? At the flood, the creation is reversed. There is a decreation. Okay? And all of those things which God had breathed his life breath into, that breath was taken away. And that water which had parted and dry land had appeared, now that water came back over the land. And in fact, you remember God had separated the waters from the waters? Mm -hmm. Now the torrential downpour made it such that the waters were brought back together. There is a decreation. And again, the, the rain stops. And what happens? What hovered over the waters at creation? The Spirit of God. And what does Noah send forth from the ark? A dove. A symbol of the Spirit of God. In fact, before he sends forth the dove, what does he send forth? A raven, which is what color? Black. Darkness was upon the face of the waters. I'm going really fast for you guys. It's okay. Well, don't worry. Don't worry. You have plenty of time during the week to read. <laughs> and we can call you if we get You can call me anytime. That's my job. You can call me at 11 o'clock at night. I'd love to talk about the Bible. My wife probably wouldn't be too happy, but that's okay. All right. So, in the flood, there is a decreation and a recreation. And a man comes forth from the ark. And he stands upon dry ground again to do the will of God. Like Adam before the fall. And he sacrifices to God. And his name is? Noah. Chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. What's that sound like? Yeah. Yeah. Verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and, and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you. Okay, again, that covenant union that God continually desires to have with man. I gave you a copy out of Scott Hahn's book, The Father Who Keeps His Promises, which is a which is a very nice book. They sell it down there. I highly recommend it. Um, and it, it's it's a nice little layout. And it talks about all these different the different covenants throughout salvation history and who it's made with and its form and its sign and all that. It's nice. Take a look at it when you get home. <coughs> What might be nice if you want, what I did is I, I brought this down, I minimized it, and stuck it in there in my Bible, wherever I wanted, wherever I thought covenant, I put it in there so that when I get to that point, I can look, oh yeah, I remind myself. Okay? Um, where are we? Yeah. Okay, be fruitful and multiply. And what happens? God plants a garden in Eden, you remember, right? And he tells Adam... Till it and keep it. You be the gardener in it. And so what does Noah do? Most we're going back and forth between Adam and Noah. Hope I'm not losing you. A vineyard. Hey, he plants a vineyard. And what does he do? He eats from that vineyard, the fruit. And what happens? He gets drunk and sins and finds himself naked. What happened to the genealogy of Cain's line at the time of the flood? It disappeared. What? Well, what happened? Everybody had it. It was wiped out. The only people that were saved were Noah, mm -hmm. his three sons. What are their names? Yeah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives. Eight people were saved in the flood. Everyone else died. In fact, if you read very carefully the years that these men lived, Methuselah, who was Noah's grandfather, dies 
the same year of the flood, and the flood took place in the first month. But there was no lineage in the in the ark. It was all the, it was all Noah and his family. Okay. So what's the what's the Noah's sin? What does he do? Well, let's look at it. Verse uh, twenty, nine, chapter nine, verse twenty. Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted the vineyard and drank of the wine and became drunk. Well, there you go. And Lamb covered in his tent. And Ham, the, the father of Canaan. Okay. So look, who do we have? We have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham has a son, and his name is Canaan. That's who Canaan is. That's who the Canaanites come from. Okay. And so Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. And told his two brothers outside. And then Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah woke from his wine and knew what the youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. He, so Noah sins. And that sin redounds upon his children. Just like the sin of Adam. So Noah's sin was getting drunk. Yeah, yeah. And then cursing his son. Ah, so why was his son cursed? Why was his son cursed? It's very interesting. Look at verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. Why do you think they mention Ham as the father of Canaan right there? And they do it again later, right then when Cain, when Ham sins. You notice that? In verse 22, Ham, the father of Canaan. Mm-hmm. Why do you think they mention Ham's son? Because Cain was the Whoa, what? <laughs> okay, look, we're not going to get through Genesis. <laughs> But I got to Genesis 1, 2, 3. Let's, talk, let's just turn real quick to the book of Leviticus. What was her answer that was so wrong? She, she said, I didn't say it was wrong. Well, she okay. said, say it louder, Annie. Go ahead. Let it out. I said that Canaan was the land of incest and fornication. Oh, the land of Canaan, you said. Mm-hmm. Ah, why is it that? Because of this curse. Ah, okay. Which Look at it? Leviticus chapter 18. Verse 6. Chapter 18, verse 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Chapter 18. Don't read yet. We'll read together. Anyone that didn't bring their Bible, shame on you. Bring your Bible next time. Sorry, I don't have enough Bibles for... Uh, I, might have a couple, I don't know. I might have a couple in the back. But next time, bring your Bible. Carry your Bible wherever you go. You never know when you're going to need it. Verse 6, chapter 18, verse 6. None of you shall approach anyone near of kin to him to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. What? You remember in St. Paul, when a marriage takes place, St. Paul says the husband is the head, right? And the wife is the body, it's not because he hates women. Okay? It was a Jewish understanding of the union of the two. Okay? The body of that relationship is the woman. To see the nakedness of your father is to see the nakedness of your mother. Okay? Noah gets drunk. He passes out in his tent. And here comes Ham. And he sees in a in a real Jewish sense of seeing, <laughs> he knows the nakedness of his father, which is his mother. <clears throat> and from that union, so the theory goes, okay, which is very prevalent, a very accept, much accepted theory because of Leviticus, <clears throat> the the result of that union of Ham and his mother was what? Ham. Cursed be Canaan. Okay. You. <laughs> all right, all right, real quick. I'll do it real quick again. Hold on, just hold your questions. I'll do it real quick again. Hold on, hold on. Watch me. 
Hold on. <laughs> no, I'm not inventing this. This is it's a it's a very well held theory because of Leviticus. It's among the Jews. We'll get into another time about why women used to wear veils and stuff. But anyways, look at me. <laughs> when I got married to my wife, there were no longer two of me, or two, one me and one her. We became one. I am the head of our relationship. She is the body. And since she is the heart, and I am the eyes. Okay? That was the belief among the Jews. Okay? We clothe our bodies. So to see the nakedness of your father, okay, is to see his body. And that marital union has made them, made the, the, the husband and wife too. So it's the wife is the body of the relationship. Does that make sense? Okay? So when Ham walks in, he sees the nakedness of his father. In Hebrew, in Hebrew terms, that means to see your mother. And, and not just see, but really see. Okay? Yeah. All right? Do you mean to know? To know, yes. <laughs> All right, so go back to Genesis. Cursed be Canaan. Okay, go back to Genesis. Cursed be Canaan. Genesis 9, chapter 9. Okay, now. We hit paper I'm just not giving you everything. Okay, now. I know that might have been confusing. Don't worry. I'm here. We'll talk about it later. I'm happy to stay after and answer questions. Uh, again, our goal is to try to go all the way through Scripture, okay, hitting these points that are lost most of the time. And so you stand there going, huh? Cursed be Canaan? Ah, forget it. And you get out the New York Times. Okay, and I'm trying to give you something that stops you from doing that. Okay, so chapter nine of Genesis. Who are the three sons? Shem, and who is the oldest? Shem. 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 We always list them like that. Okay, the oldest. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, let me spell them all out. Japheth. Okay. Oh. We're not going to get into it right now, but among the Jews, okay, among the ancient people, not just the Jews, if you wanted to usurp someone's authority, okay, if you wanted to become king instead of the other guy that was reigning, you know what you would do? You would go sleep with his wives. You would, okay? And so Ham, unfortunately is not the oldest in the relationship. Okay? He would not have received the firstborn blessing. Okay? And so what does he do? He tries to usurp that authority. Okay? He tries to make a name for himself. Like Cain had tried to do in the beginning. To make a name for himself. There's a Hebrew play on, on words there in the text. The word for name in Hebrew is Shem. Okay? So the firstborn son of Noah is the one who receives the name. He receives the authority of his father. And so what does Ham try to do? He tries to make a name for himself, just like Cain had done in the beginning. Okay? Tries to make a name for himself. Now, Notice also, cursed be Cain, in verse 25. Cursed be Cain, a slave of slaves he shall be to his brother. The Canaanites are to be slaves, servants, to Shem, to the Semites. That's where we get that term Semite. Okay, because of Shem. A Shemite, a Semite. Okay. The Canaanites are supposed to be servants and slaves to the house of Shem. And we're going to find out, we're going to see what happens. Like father, like son, right? Like son, like father, son. Nine twenty-five. Yeah. Okay. Chapter ten, verse one. Yes. Sorry, but you come in the age um, chronological order. Yes. But why did it say like, when he ran with his youngest son had done? Right. I was saying. Does it say that? 
Oh, you know what? Because yeah, in the Hebrew, that's a it's a mistranslation. It's it's little. Okay, I'm not making that up. I have a note in my Bible. Okay. It's little. His little son. So he probably was a man short of stature or whatever. Okay. Translation into English is never perfect. So you gotta do the best you can with it. Okay? Either way, it doesn't matter. The point is that Shem was the, the one who would receive the blessing. Okay? He would receive the covenant. Okay? And so there was, they tried to usurp. Okay, chapter 10, verse 1. By the way, that's a great reading. Who, who is it that pointed that out? Just, yeah, that's great. I mean, that's to pay attention like that. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The son of Japheth was going, da, 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 da. right? And you fall asleep. Don't fall asleep because it's trying to tell you something. Okay? First of all, um, uh, we, get this, we get the genealogy of Japheth. Okay? They get J, J, Normally, in, in the genealogies of the Hebrews, you would place the oldest son first. But in this set of genealogies, it's reversed. And the youngest son, Japheth, is mentioned first and is listed. Why is that? Okay, you've got to ask the question, why? First of all, you get Japheth. And then whose genealogy comes next? Yeah. Ham's genealogy. And from Ham comes Canaan. Okay? And then what genealogy comes next? I know I'm skipping really fast. But you're looking at, at uh, Japheth's genealogy in verse 2 through 5, Ham's genealogy in verse 6 through uh, 14, and then you get Canaan. And then finally you get Shem. Finally you get Shem mentioned. Last. Why is that? Why is that? When you're reading these things, you've got to see the page as a picture. Okay, it's not again written like the New York Times. It's written. What's that? What? Yeah. You're confusing me because. Okay, I'm sorry. Because of this, this idea. Where does it tell me in my mind that I have to know that this is he's he's the youngest instead of the young, the oldest? And this would. I mean, where does it say here that he says the descendants? Yeah. Because because among the Hebrews, you always list the oldest first. Yes. Okay, and then the next, and then the next. Don't but don't get caught up on that. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's really not that this important. This is reversed in this way. I'm saying yes, it is reversed. And Shem, who is the oldest, clearly, is mentioned last. And that is important. Okay? We're getting there, but we're not going to mention that word right now. Sorry. Okay? Now, what story comes after the genealogy of Shem? Yeah, you guys can just scan and you can find it right up there at the top of your page. It'll normally mention the story. The Tower of Babel. Okay? Which chapter? Oh, 11. Chapter 11. Thank you. And right after the story of Babel, whose genealogy appears again? Shem. Shem's genealogy. Shem's genealogy is mentioned twice. Why? The question is answered by what is in the middle. It's the story of Babel. Okay? Now, go back to chapter 10, verse 6 with me. This chapter? Chapter 10, verse 6. <coughs> chapter 10, verse 6. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Okay, Egypt becomes a... Ah, so do you know where the Egyptians are going to fit into the story of well, salvation history? Is, <coughs> what's that? Egypt. Egypt. Oh, yeah, well, okay. And so on, okay, verse 9, or verse 8, sorry. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Nimrod is a son of... Of the evil line. I got the most. I'm sorry. Which, which, uh, verse, verse 9 and 10. Chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Thank you. Okay? Nimrod, who becomes the leader of Babel, is supposed to be 
a slave of slaves to Shem. You remember the curse. Okay? And here he is building a kingdom for himself. In a sense, going into revolt. Okay, now, hold with me and move to chapter 11, verse 1. Now, the whole earth had one language and a few words. And as men migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitum and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Sounds like Enoch. Let us make a Shem for ourselves. Okay? The whole story from Noah through these couple of genealogies to the story of Babel is the story again of those people trying to make a name for themselves, trying to make, in a sense, a Shem for themselves, trying to usurp the authority which was not rightly theirs. Okay? Now, I'm going to do one last thing and I'm going to call it good. Immediately after the story of Babel, in chapter 11, verse 10, these are the descendants of Shem. When Shem was a hunter, and blah, 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 right? And so on. And Ark of Pachashah, and whatever. And so on. From verse chapter 11, verse 10, all the way down, you see all these names. You see it? Just scan it. You see all those names? Yeah. Surug and Nahor. Verse 24. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. And Nahor lived after the birth of Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram. Abraham is a descendant of Shem, of the holy line of God. Do you see how the genealogies are essential? Now you know how Abraham is connected to the story of the flood. In which uh, in which verse is that one? Verse twenty-six and twenty-seven. <coughs> Chapter eleven, verse twenty-six and twenty-seven. Okay. Now I know that's a lot, and some of you are shaking your head, going, "You gotta be kidding me." Okay. Now we only covered twelve chapters. I would recommend to you. To go back, you can see this is not a, 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 a writing in New York Times that a guy jotted down five hours ago, or, you know, and then they printed it off. Okay? This is steeped through and through with divine inspiration. Underneath the surface is, in a sense, the Garden of Eden. It's jewels to be found if you read slowly and carefully. <coughs> you don't have to get everything the first time. The most important thing for us in this Bible study is to get the essential points to follow from Adam to Seth, from Seth to Enoch, from Enoch to Noah, from Noah to Shem, from Shem to Abraham. And we're going to keep going from there so that you in your mind can draw a line from Adam to Jesus Christ. And understand the story of salvation history. If you got lost about whoever's why is doing whatever to whoever, don't worry about that. Okay? Those are the little stories that are fun that we can get into. Okay? But we're going to build this bridge from person to person all the way through salvation history. Is this, this is a universal story part of the basis for the often reference to first shall be last and last shall be first? That the that thing is something that's gonna go on all through our story, okay? That there's this reversal of order taking place and people trying to usurp authority and others not or the blessing given to the to the younger and all of that. So okay. I'm gonna do something I haven't done before in our studies together, and that is I'm gonna take questions, but I know you guys need to go. So I'm gonna give 30 seconds for those people that need to go to stand up, to exit the door, and then I'll take questions for five minutes, and then you can have as much wine and whatever as you want. And in that 30 seconds, if the people want to get wine, feel free. Next week, we'll meet at the same time, 7.30, and, uh, and keep going from there.
I promise it'll only be five minutes of questions. I won't go on and on. But you won't offend me if you need to go to the Then the other one is related. Well, hold on. Let's, we'll get back to you. I'm wondering why Ham's city is mother is couched in the Ah, that's a great question. I should have mentioned that. Well, I have it noted to get to it in a couple of minutes here in my notes. Why was it that the sin was couched in such kind of vague terms? Throughout the Old Testament, you constantly run into a situation where a man does something you shouldn't do, okay? And he receives the curse from that. But it's never mentioned that he receives the curse explicitly, especially if he's a holy man, okay? Now, it's, with him, it's not true that he's a holy man. But oftentimes, the Hebrews would not write explicitly about the sins of their fathers. They would tell the story, so you knew. And they would tell the story of the result of it, okay? But they won't say it explicitly. Okay, for example, I'll give you an example. Abraham is told to go and take the promised land. Abraham is given the promised land. He gets there. Okay, God says, go there and stay there. He goes there, there's a famine. So what does he do? He leaves. He goes to Egypt. In the text, it doesn't appear that Abraham's done anything wrong, unless you're reading going, wait a minute, God told him to go there and stay. Okay, and he went to Egypt. And when he goes to Egypt, and he comes back, what happens? What woman does he... Those kids are gone. I felt terrible. I kept forgetting the kids were there. But anyways... Um, what woman does Abraham have relations with? Do you remember? His slave? Yeah, his wife's servant. He goes down into Egypt. His wife takes a servant. They come back, and then he has relations with her. Okay? And this is going to get heavy duty again, so if I lose you, hold on. Just, it's okay. Um... When he finally does the right thing and has a relationship, relationship with his wife and ends up having a son, Isaac, what is the sign of the covenant? 
What is the sign of the covenant that God says do this? Circumcision. Circumcision was a practice of the Egyptians. Okay? Not something that's fun to do as an older man. But for the Hebrews, they're reading the text, they see the result of their father Abraham's sin in the text, in the story. It's played out. Okay? So oftentimes they don't want to trash the name of the guy, and so they just tell the story of him. So it's cool. Okay? It's a cultural thing, yeah. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> yes? Oh. Speaking of the I'm sorry, because I have okay. questions. Yeah. Back to the ham story. Is that why it says they saw, or he saw his father's nakedness as opposed to he knew his father? Is that where his father's Well, to see and to know are two words that are interchangeable. Okay? Um, we receive our knowledge through our sight. Okay? And watch this also. Why is it called carnal knowledge? Because when you know something, as, uh, as St. Thomas Aquinas says and Aristotle says, when you know something, the knower and the known are made one. Uh, knowledge is the union of the knower and the known. Why? Because when I know something, it becomes part of me. I can, look, I can close my eyes right now and see my truck. I know my wife. I can see all these things because when I know something, it's really made part of me. It's the same with my vision. Okay? When I see something, all of a sudden I get it inside me. So knowledge and sight and, and marital relations say it can be used interchangeably. Those words can be, you know, whatever. Okay. Last question. Go. Okay, this is sort of related. Yeah. Okay, if you look at uh, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 9, okay, then it, it, at, uh, in the story of the flood, he's on to say that uh, these three, Noah's sons, were the sons of Noah, and from them the whole earth was people. Yes. And if you go before that, and, and start chapter 9, it says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fertile, be fertile and multiply and fill the earth. Does that mean whatever happened before that is... Yeah, the flood wiped everything. Forget it. <laughs> everything was wiped out. the genealogy and everything else. Yeah. And everything was wiped out. Nine. It started again. Yeah, it started over again. Well, where did they find their wives? Again, I'm going to leave that for a further discussion with my brother. My brother's in, has a degree in biology, so he understands the whole argument to me. That's called passing the buck. I know! <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's true. No, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Come on. Their wives were with them. So so Their wives were with them in the flood. Yeah, that's true. But, it, but it's still the question of Cain in the beginning, and that gets to the perfect genial or the perfect genes, which is an argument with a with a person so who's not genes. So and the I time don't. of Noah, there must have been a lot of incest. No, the time of Noah, they had they, they had their wives. They brought their wives with them. But uh, but then their children. Where did everybody come from then? If, if they didn't. Yeah, they were first, okay. First cousins could marry. Yes, or second cousins and a couple generations down. You're right. Don't they? All right. Five minutes is up. I'll take any other questions except on on incest and all that stuff. <laughs> Why don't we stand and face the cross and finish in prayer? And I'll stay for any questions that you guys might have. In nomine Patris et Filius Spiritus Sancti. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.